Well, welcome to An Ear on Our Birds. Uh, my name is Gary Casper, and I'm going to be talking about avian bioacoustic monitoring and throw in a few other things today. Before we get going, let's test our sound system and see if we can play this Virginia Rail spectrogram and get you guys introduced to what these sounds are like. So here we're looking at this pattern right here at the bottom, and we're going to play that. Again. So this is an example of a spectrogram that we get from recording digitally in the field, and that's the sound of a Virginia rail. There we go. Okay, so before we get started, just a few acknowledgments. Uh, I want to acknowledge all the people that have helped with this project. It's nothing I could ever have done on my own, and we've been working on this for about a decade. So we have a whole bunch of data analysts that are expert on animal sounds, and a whole bunch of organizations that have funded this work over the years. The way this works is we record digital sounds uh, on these recorders that can be used for research, inventory, and monitoring. Putting up these recorders has a lot of advantages. They're non-intrusive. You can put them in remote locations. They collect very large sample sizes, are quite affordable, automated, and they give you voucher records that you can have independently verified. On the con side, a fair amount of sophisticated data analysis is required along with interpretation and of course you get no visual data like you would with, for example, point counts. A lot of people are using bioacoustics now to study all sorts of things, including fish, whales, insects, even turtles. Here you see sitting on a beach in Brazil, Camilla Ferrara, she was the one who first discovered that turtles talk. And since then, uh, my team has done a little bit of work on turtles, which I can show you some of. So we've put recorders on turtle nests on the Wisconsin River, and this is one of the sounds that we recorded in map turtle nest. Here's another example. And I'm going to show you a few other examples of turtles talking in the nests. So these sounds are in the egg. So as you can see, that's quite a variety of sounds for turtles to be making. And we don't know what those sounds mean, only that they're making them at this point. So we're discovering a lot of new things by doing bioacoustics, things we didn't know animals did. And new ways to identify animals and understand how they're communicating. So the equipment for this is pretty straightforward. There's a, a variety of manufacturers now making the recorders. In North America, most people are utilizing three manufacturers, Wildlife Acoustics, Audio Moth, and Anabat. And these can range anywhere from $100 to $1,200 per station. There's been a lot of work done on bats using ultrasonic recorders, including here at the Mequon Nature Preserve. So we started bat surveys here in 2018, and you see here a map of all the stations that are used each year, and an example of a recorder on a pole with the microphone up high. With this, we can collect 
a lot of bat uh, vocalizations and develop a checklist. So here at the preserve we've now documented six species of bats present, three of which are rare and two of which are common, and two state threatened species being present. So this helps inform the habitat management because we want these bats to do well. With the data we're also able to track bat activity. Um, so this is the number of bat passes that are recorded as the bat flies by the recorder. So you can look at this in various ways. Uh, these charts are looking at activity per night for each species at each site. And you can see which sites the species are more active at. If you're wondering about the uh, program, these data are run through two different programs, Kaleidoscope and Sonobat, which gives somewhat different results. But we do this as a proofing step to make sure that the um, automated detections are, are verified. You can also display the data in other ways. Uh, the, this graph shows activity per night. So this is often might be associated with higher bat activity when there's insect hatches or uh, uh, suitable weather for insects to be flying. Then we put up different recorders to do bird and frog surveys. So this is during the breeding season of both, both taxa. And there's three permanent stations now at the Mequon Nature Preserve. And I'll also be showing you some data and examples from other properties. So let's start by looking a little bit at frogs and then we'll get into birds. So the data collection uh, and management is not really a trivial thing. This takes uh, a fair amount of, of work. We're analyzing terabytes of data every year and this goes through through different analysis processes. The first is a manual step where we view the spectrograms and play back the sounds and an expert identifies them. And then for some taxa, especially bats and frogs, we also do an automated analysis where the data is run through an algorithm and then those results are manually proved. So like any good scientist, you have to have a study design if you're going to embark on this process to both collect your data well, analyze it well, and then get some metrics out of it so you can use it uh, for understanding your habitat management and the success of your projects. So the study design might look at things like the sites that are selected for monitoring, how the data is analyzed, uh, the number of sites monitored to answer your questions, uh, the number of replicates needed, and then uh, addressing error rates. So here you see some coyotes. They often show up on our our surveys and we can take a listen to them. We have a real nice coyote chorus from a Sheboygan site. So that's at a uh, land trust property in the city of Sheboygan managed by the Glacial Lakes Conservancy. And it turns out the coyotes are an apex predator on that site and a species that they are definitely paying attention to. They want it around to help with uh, maintaining the biodiversity of that preserve. Our acoustic protocols also look at the survey period, which is tailored to the species you're trying to find as well as the time of day. So for example, frogs call at night, birds call in the morning. All this data often undergoes a filtering process to, to, to further reduce uh, false presences and absences in the data analysis. 
and then steps for proofing and error rate calculations so that we can parse some metrics out of it to compare year to year for trends. So for all of the taxa we're studying, we're using a dual survey approach um, and this produces metrics on species richness, occupancy, calling intensity or activity levels, and counts. So these can be quantifiable metrics that you can use to compare year to year and site to site. So how does this work for frogs? Well, when you run all the data through algorithms, you get very large tables with hundreds of detections, sometimes thousands. These uh, all have to be proofed, and the outcome we're looking for for the proofing is to verify the first and last detection at each site in each year. So this helps us get some of the metrics, including how long the number of nights the species might have been calling on a site. This is what some of the spectrograms look like for the frog surveys. So after we get those automated results, we also do a manual survey looking at 30 samples at each site per year, completely independent of the automated results. And here we can record the call intensity as well. So we might be going through spectrograms and see a pattern uh, like, like the bullfrog here. So you can get a variety of frog courses going at once there and identify the species and the calling intensity. So that calling intensity can then be graphed. So this, this gets to some of the more usefulness of the data. So here you're seeing uh, different species and different colors and data from both 2015 and 2016. So you can now graphically understand which species are calling more at each site and whether their calling intensity changed between these two years. So the more years of data you get in this kind of analysis, the more useful it becomes. And you might, you might see species increasing or decreasing. Similar thing with the calling duration. You can look at um, how long a species is present on site calling. And here you can see some interesting patterns uh, where, for example, American toads have pretty variable calling periods, whereas green frogs are pretty much calling all the time. And then you have species that call very little, like at the right side of the graph, the leopard frogs and chorus frogs are easy to miss. We can also look at how many of the samples are occupied. So this analysis can be done on the manual survey counts or the automated counts, but the automated counts undergo a number of error corrections to, to eliminate or at least reduce false presences and, and false absences. So here you can see how uh, many species are calling in most samples and others are calling in only a few and how this changes year to year. So I'm showing you these metrics for frogs, but we're going to look at similar things for birds. So let's start talking about birds. So the bird protocols are a little different. Uh, morning samples of 10 minute duration are utilized and the survey looks at 15 samples in each site in each year. And then we're after the same metrics, occupancy count and duration. So we always have three expert observers doing the analyses. Uh, the first one makes a checklist, the second observer proofs it, and then if needed, a uh, third observer will come in to make final determinations. When I say expert observers, the observers definitely need to be familiar with the local dialects uh, of the species 
present on site so they can properly identify them. And then we also used the uh, Macaulay Reference Library and the Peterson Field Guide to Bird Sounds to further proof things and make sure that nothing is sneaking by that's an error. Some of these calls are fairly obvious. Uh, when you look at the spectrograms, you can pick out these patterns. So this here happens to be a whippoorwill. And uh, I can show you what that looks like and listen to it. If I click the right thing here, Whippoorwill. So that's a pretty obvious call that might come out of a frog analysis because it just jumps out at you. This particular site in uh, eastern Ozaki County, we did not expect whippoorwills to be there, but after recording them, it was obvious that they were. So this particular example spectrogram is from May 6th, so we concluded this would have been a migrant, but in this actual case, uh, the calling persisted into June. So we did put this down on the bird checklist as a potential breeding population. Now some species require a little different protocol. Uh, normally we're analyzing only June samples, but if you're looking for something like rough grouse, you need to be looking in April and May. Rough grouse can be hard to pick out a background noise. Uh, you can see on the spectrogram here, though, that the drum roll does rise above the sound of, of the uh, low-frequency background noise, and you can pick this out if you zoom in on that frequency. Other animals, such as owls, are not going to be picked up on your morning surveys. So let's look at, or let's listen to a spectrogram that picked up an owl, and you can maybe ask yourself what species it is. So here's one, and this is an owl, and you can try to identify this at home. Very distinctive pattern of short hoots. So that's the great horned owl. And the other one on that slide is in this spectrogram, and it's going to be a lot harder to pick out, so here's a real test. That was it. So you see this trill down at the bottom, right there? That's what we're listening for. I'm going to play it again. One more time. That's a screech owl. So this came up on a morning sample on an actual bird survey in June. And you can see the analysts going through the spectrogram would easily be picking out these louder sounds, so you really have to be paying attention for something like this to, to show up. And in this case, we caught it and know that there were screech owls in June. Uh, this happened to be in the Cedarburg Bog. So, after analyzing all that data, finding these things. You can do similar things with the data. So here we're looking at species richness at the uh, Career Conservancy in Osaki County. And we have a, a number of sites and years graphed on this chart comparing point counts with acoustic surveys. And you can see that the results are very similar in terms of the number of species detected. Although the types of species do differ between what you're getting from point counts versus acoustics. Because some species don't make uh, much in the way of calls, 
so they're better detected visually. So in this case we had Sedrens and Henslow sparrows showing up in these files. And let's just look at some examples of those. So here's a Sedren call. Fairly easy one. And the Henslow Sparrow is going to be a little more difficult. So now you'll notice that I have cut off the bottom frequencies. This is what they look like and they obscure the sound of the sparrow, so I'm cutting them off. And this is the sparrow. Fairly high frequency and hard to hear. So hopefully you could hear that. It's quiet, it's high frequency. But notice that in the spectrograms, it really stands out, even if you don't have the bottom frequencies filtered out. You can see that, and you know there's something calling, so then you spend the time to zoom in on it and identify it. So that works pretty well with the acoustic surveys. Uh, obviously, this might have been overlooked on a point count because it's so quiet and the sound can be obscured. So we can also look at a little closer at species richness by method. So here again we have point counts in orange compared to acoustic surveys in the gray bars. And the blue bars are the combined checklists. So what's interesting here is that both methods miss species. But they both detect about the same number of species. So they're both good methods for monitoring a bird community, but they monitor a little different part of the bird community that's actually present at a site. Now we'll do a snap quiz. So here's a spectrogram that's being analyzed from a managed grassland along a stream with some shrubs community in Ozaki County. And let's play that one. Uh, let's see. That one's here. Now you're going to see a couple things happening here. There's these two sharp notes and a bird in between. Try it again. So we want to try to identify this one right after that sharp note. Some of you may have succeeded. This is the willow flycatcher doing that Fitzboo call. Fitzboo. And the sharp notes on the end, I'm going to guess are either a robin alarm call or a downy woodpecker. That's what the willow flycatcher looks like, and that's, again, a pattern you can pick out visually and then play back acoustically to confirm. So here at the Mequon Nature Preserve, we've been looking at data from 2015 so far. There's three sites being monitored, and you can see here there's some difference in species richness uh, on the top graph with one site 36 species, the other only 30 and one in between. At the bottom we're looking at how many of the species detected are found at only one site versus two sites versus three sites. So here we had 11 species picked up at only one site. So that might be kind of interesting. Here's that list. And this gets to interpreting data. So when you have something like a chimney swift show up at only one site, what does that really mean for your property management? Well, that species is an aerial insectivore. It's flying around above all these recorders. One happened to pick it up. Probably not very meaningful that it was only found at one. 
the eastern bluebird, we know from nest box surveys, does nest on the property. Apparently only one recorder picked it up in this year, but that's probably not terribly significant because eastern bluebirds are really not very noisy. And we get better data from the nest box surveys than we do from the acoustic surveys for that species. This last one pictured is the red-eyed vireo. Now red-eyed vireos sing loud and frequently. So they're a prime candidate for acoustic surveys and the fact that they were found at only one site would be significant here. And I'm guessing that would be the one site that was next to a forest patch that was occupied in this year by red-eyed vireos. Looking more closely at our avian metrics, we do tease out the priority species. So this is based on the Partners in Flight Regional Conservation Score. So these are the species that in our region we would feel a stewardship responsibility for. This is a part of the country where they are declining but still present and we don't want declines to go any further. So here we're displaying data for just these priority species and the count metric, so the number of samples occupied in this year. And here you can see some of these priority species are found in most samples like red-winged blackbirds. Others like the eastern meadowlark are much more common at one site than the other two. So this helps the land manager understand where these priority species are in the landscape and there may be management implications at those sites to help them succeed in nesting. We can do the same thing for the duration metric. So here you see with the eastern meadowlark, the sites suddenly look more equal, but that just means that there was a similar span between the first and last detections, whereas the count metric was maybe more meaningful in this context because that's how often the meadowlarks are calling. So while they're showing up the other sites with a long duration, they had low counts at those sites. So they're, they, they may just be more vagrant there. And, and the real the site number one is the, is the one where they're concentrated at in this year. So both these metrics come into play with uh, analyzing the data from a habitat management perspective and focusing on the priority species for our region. So to sum up, uh, acoustic monitoring can give you greatly improved statistics for your bird surveys uh, as well as frog and bat surveys. Because of the large sample sizes, you can get high confidence. Using this technique is non-invasive. You don't have to send people into the habitat. You just set up a recorder there that does not disturb animals or habitat. There's protocols available for all of these species that keep improving but experts are still needed for processing the data. There's also potential to pool data across regions. So like an entire county, everybody doing this could pool their data to look at regional trends in these species. And with that, I'm gonna wrap up the lecture and we're gonna take on the question and answer period. How big the area is a month cover? So the question, yeah, that's a good question. So the question is how far away does the mic cover? So the detection distance depends upon the habitat and the terrain. Uh, but we've pretty much concluded that the microphones are about the same as a good human ear. Sometimes better, but never worse than a human ear. You really pioneered some of this stuff, at least in this, in this region. How, how, how widespread has this being used now? Is this, is this becoming the standard for uh, research in the, in the uh, trying, trying to set this counts on the species? And, and is this being thought now? If you, know, if you go to the point these days, are there classes in biological systems? Yeah, good question. So is this being taught? Is it becoming standard? How widespread is its use? Um, I would say it's a very rapidly emerging technology. 
that's still developing. Uh, whether there's classes being taught on it, I don't know. But many uh, groups and agencies are deep into it, even more so than I am. Uh, so some of the people I work with, I mean, you can imagine the uh, repetition and, and difficulty of dealing with terabytes of data every year. Um, so some of the people I work with automate that process of like selecting files out of archives, moving them around, running them through, usually by using uh, our programming scripts. So, and, and then of course, there's people using it for fish, for whales, for bats, for turtles. So yeah, it's everywhere now. Jim? When we do point counts to compare to acoustics, the, the, the person doing the point count stands right next to the recorder during, during the same days that the recorder is on. Yep. Back. If you haven't said point of with bird, the sound Oh yeah, yeah. I'll tell you one thing, the people involved with these analyses have been learning a lot. Uh, a lot about what they think they knew and a lot of new things they never thought of. So like some of the more interesting things we, we had going were, once we thought we had profanatory warblers calling from uh, Gilbert Lake in Washington County and ultimately concluded it was swamp sparrows with a little different song that we're used to hearing from them. In another instance, we had a prothonotary warp, or no, no, hooded warbler, identified by the acoustic surveyors. And two people agreed, yeah, cool, we got a hooded warbler. Some of us, especially uh, Nathaniel, who was working on the site doing point counts, uh, were still a bit skeptical of this. So ultimately, both he and I observed this bird, and it was an indigo bunting. So mistakes do happen. Uh, the nice thing about the acoustics is you've got a voucher record that you can go back to. With the point counts, we don't know how many mistakes are happening because it's just, this is what the, the person thought at that time, but unless they recorded it, there's no, there, there's no way to verify it. Can you use it in a bio blitz? Acoustics? Can you use it in what? A bio, a bio blitz? Uh, sure, sure. You could set out some recorders. Uh, somebody would have to analyze the data later, but yeah. So a, a lot of times I use this just for inventory. So people are wondering what's on my property. So you do a year or two and you give them the results. But other people, especially doing long-term restoration like they are here, want to continue the monitoring year after year so they can see what's changing. Uh, I just uh, have a comment. Uh, maybe a question will come out of comments. I'm not sure. Um, but at the uh, Cedarbird log, uh, we were involved in including the uh, Freedom Bird Atlas uh, 2015 to 2019. And uh, that was about the most arduous uh, bird survey I've ever done. <laughs> um, I spent just to get to some of the sites, uh, it would take almost, in some cases, two hours, an hour, an hour, an hour back, sometimes longer. And in the course of getting out there, uh, you're flushing things, and by the time you get there, you're exhausted. And then trying to do the survey, and then get back before dark. I mean, it was just, uh, it was really one of the more stressful uh, surveys that I've ever done. But now that we have uh, the, uh, the acoustic monitors going out there, uh, I think it's going to change the, our whole notion of how to do surveys and remote. I think it is changing uh, our, our whole concept of how best to determine 
what's in a, in a habitat that is inaccessible and very uh, remote. And uh, so I just wanted to maybe you could comment about that a little bit here. Sure, John was pointing out uh, the travails of field work uh, when you're trying to do bird surveys in remote areas that might take an hour or two just to walk in and then do your survey and then you have to walk out again. Um, so with the acoustic technology, you can eliminate a lot of that field time. And uh, I think this is really where the acoustics shine. It allows you to sample in places that are very remote. You only have to make two trips. We've been running uh, frog acoustics on Isle Royale and the Apostle Islands for seven years now, I think. And in the early years, we would get the boat to go out to the island as soon as they could in the spring, sometimes a dangerous ordeal. But even, we learned rapidly that even then, we never made it out in time to get the wood frogs. They were already almost done. So now we go out in the fall and set them up on a delayed start. And then and now they're getting the wood frogs. But those recorders can sit on that island, you know, for months recording data. And then the, when the park uh, staff has time in their busy summer schedules, they just go pick them up in August or September. And then we have all the data. Carl? Which point of those monitors can uh, feed their signal back to somebody so they, they can just be out there long term? Or is there a lifespan? So the question is can the monitors feed the data back to you, presumably by a satellite or cell connection? Theoretically, yes, but with the amount of data we're talking about. So each recorder is, is collecting typically about anywhere from 60 to 150 gigabytes of data per year. To run that much data up through a cell or a satellite connection would be very expensive. Andrea? Do you, do you find that on sites where a lot of active management is going on, does, do you find that that skew, skewed your data, or are you able to parse through and still identify some of those signatures? So the question is on sites being actively managed, is there, is there a noise problem? Yes. Um, yeah, that can, can be the case, but usually it's not the management activities. You know, if there's an occasional chainsaw running, you just move to a different sample. The bigger problem is traffic. That's the biggest thing. Snippets you played for us, you were able to bring. I would I assume to be traffic that frequency down. Mm -hmm. Is that something you can do on most most calls where you can kind of cancel that out a little bit, or is that not only often you can cancel out some or most of the the noise. The real problem comes when the frequency you're trying to find, bird call or the frog call, is in the same band as the noise. So bullfrogs are a great example. They're down there in the bottom where all the noise is, just like the rough grouse drums. Uh, so the question is, if you're monitoring a restoration site, are we noticing changes in the avian or frog community as time goes on and the habitat's restored? And the answer would be yes, definitely. Um, you know, here at Mequon Nature Preserve, um, it, they started out as mostly farm fields, restored some wetlands, Initially, there were very few frog species. Then chorus frogs appeared. Then wood frogs appeared. Then tree frogs appeared. And you know they're coming from the surrounding landscape and making their way in for the most part. But yeah, by doing this, you're able to discover that. And then of course that helps you to say that our restoration is working. We're addressing the biodiversity crisis. These species are coming back. Yes, it also informs management that hasn't started yet. Well, 
people always want measures before they give it an extra grant. Yeah, so Carl's pointing out that these metrics are important uh, to disseminate amongst our profession and especially to the grantors so that they understand that this is a, a way to quantify your success. Well, thank you all for coming. Oh, one more question. Oh, sure. Exciting or unexpected where you went with the intent of finding one taxon, you know, you've drawn like a ton of material. Anything like wild? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the question is have we found anything really special? Um, so cricket frogs would be an example on the Mississippi River. No one knew they were there, like no records ever in all history. And we picked them up on our acoustic surveys uh, without knowing they were there. Okay, well, I know we've run over. Thank you all for coming.